Hello, welcome back. One of our, I think this might be our last video recording for Business Ethics Spring 2019. Um, we've got a real doozy to talk about tonight with the Cohen paper. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this one. This one's really fun. I think Cohen's got a lot of interesting ideas, even if you don't agree with socialism or much less communism or the kind of general game plan that Cohen's got going on. I think he's got some really, really interesting things to say about capitalism and how to understand what's going on with it. Um, there's a lot to talk about here. And it's my anticipation that this is probably the most challenging reading of the quarter. Um, the one that's more most likely that uh, you're like going through it, going through the reading on your own and being like, whoo, uh, not sure what to do with that. <laughs> As I mentioned on Tuesday at the end of class, um, it starts off right with a bang with all this stuff about defining what freedom is and how you m must be free to do things that you are forced to do. And that's like, what's going on there? Um, but like I said, I, I hope you're able to push past that and follow my advice from the end of class and uh, get some touchstones from the reading, um, even if it's kind of there's a lot of things that are hazy or maybe have some misconceptions about, which is what I really expect. Um, this quarter, I you know I just got done giving this lecture this afternoon to my other section of business ethics, and what happened, uh, what I'm used to have happen happening definitely happened. Um, people uh, came into the class uh, thinking that Cohen was saying things that he wasn't, or defending a position that he wasn't, or things like that. So um, definitely, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, one reason is that. Cohen's general position is not one that uh, resonates as much with American intuitions. Uh, not, again, always, but for the most part, uh, he's saying things that are maybe somewhat counterintuitive to us. They definitely represent a, uh, if we were going to say follow his advice, it would involve drastic changes to the way our society functions. Um, so those would be maybe pretty counterintuitive. But also, even if you're somewhat familiar with socialism or with Marxism more generally, um, he, you might also have been a little confused. Even with that under your belt, you probably would have been confused um, or maybe confused with how Cohen is going about uh, articulating Marxism or his version of Marxism, especially in terms of the kinds of arguments he's using, which are extremely original. Um, I have sometimes described this uh, paper, this particular paper before, as one of the most elegant judo moves in all of philosophy that I've ever encountered. Um, he really flips the tables on and and um, surprises our expectations. So that might have also thrown you for a little bit of a loop. Um, I actually had a student in my last class ask me, why do this version of Marxism? Why do Cohen? And there's a couple reasons. Um, one big reason is that Cohen is just one of the most um, prominent uh, and influential modern Marxists. Uh, he died recently, I think 2009. Um, so he's pretty, I mean, that's like yesterday in the history of philosophy. Uh, so, and, and he's had a, a very lasting influence on the way we think about Marxism in late 20th century, early 21st century. It's very, uh, it's, it's pretty different. I mean, it's evolved a lot from 19th century Marx. Um, but the, a lot of it, the core inspirations are the same. Um, but definitely Cohen's giving it a, a big updating. So that's one reason why I gave you Cohen. The other reason is that this paper, more so than um, other works on Marxism, I thought is, is actually relatively accessible for us. There's a lot of ideas in this paper that are drawing on some of the, con the conceptual vocabulary that we've developed over the course of this quarter. So it kind of sinks in pretty nicely. And then finally, and this is probably the most important reason, um, <laughs> I struggle to find exactly the right words for this, but uh, I'm, I'm tempted to say Cohen is one of the most reasonable Marxists that I've heard. And by that I just mean that he's much more than many other Marxists, really engaged with his capitalist opponents. A lot of times Marxists are just going to like rail against the evils of capitalism and it's, um, it, it's, 
the biasing impact that it has, the um, the destructive coercion that it involves, the loss of identity or the dissociation that laborers have from uh, their own bodies. There's there's all this other stuff that goes on with Marxism that doesn't quite intersect in dialogue with their opponents. They're just kind of coming from really different paradigms. And one of Cohen's brilliant, one of the aspects of his brilliance, I think, is his ability to not water down anything about Marxism at all, but still connect the dots to like talk about it and argue for it in a way that is coherent and uh, accessible to anyone who's a fan of capitalism. I mean, he's uh, in most um, dramatically with the libertarian opponent, um, the person who's like Milton Friedman, like rah, rah, free market economy all the way kind of thing. Um, he's very much engaged with them, and that isn't just a matter of rhetoric or style, but it, very much in substance. Um, because in the broad strokes, I could summarize Cohen's paper here in the following gambit. He wants to argue for communism, communally held property instead of private property, capitalism, uh, on the grounds that it promotes freedom. And that is a little different. <laughs> that is not how it usually gets framed up. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes here. Um, but this is usually, this is kind of like Cohen playing in a way game. He's not arguing for his position uh, on the home field. He doesn't have the home field advantage here. He's not preaching to the choir. He's going over to where his opponents hang out and playing by their rules on their turf and trying to beat them there. And we'll see what you think of his arguments. But I think I found that um, in sharing Cohen's ideas with people, I, I'm no, uh, just for the record, I, I'm no card-carrying Marxist. Um, I think Marx has some really, really interesting things to say. I'm not, uh, oh no, what happened there? Woo! Uh, Can you hear me? Looks like I got dropped. My back? Everyone in the chat can you hear me? Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. There's just a weird little hiccup in the internet. Um, I was saying, I'm, I'm no card-carrying Marxist. I appreciate a lot of the stuff that Marx did. There's some other parts of his philosophy that I'm like really not down with. Um, some of his, like, broader stuff with Hegel and all this other junk I won't get into. Um, but I appreciate a lot of the things that he has to say, and I especially appreciate his critiques of, of capitalism, the way that he shows kind of its, um, where, where its moral promises kind of break down and why it's not the end of uh, a progressive movement, um, which is how it started. I, so I should probably put my hat head back for this one. I mean, capitalism, we've talked about before with Warhain, has a lot of things to morally justify itself. Um, and specifically on grounds of freedom. To move from a feudalistic society to a capitalist society seems to be a step in the right direction. It's giving people a lot more autonomy over their lives than they had before un under feudalism um, or any kind of like totalitarian state. Um, that seems like a plus. Uh, but what Marx does is kind of show like there's a lot more to do with regard to the exact progressive values that motivated uh, an appeal for capitalism in the first place um, as a moral system, right? As a social system that can claim um, moral legitimacy. That's an expression of principles of social justice. And we saw a little bit of that with Werhein. Um, and another reason that why I say Cohen is one of the most reasonable Marxists I know is that for all the way in which a Marxist lens shows you the cracks in the facade of capitalism as an ideal, that, that it's like arguing for that kind of thing, Cohen is happy to give credit where credit is due. And he wants to say, yeah, capitalism does promote freedom, but in a limited way, and we can do better. So that's kind of the main point of, um, that's kind of the main point of the article is that Cohen wants to appeal to the very moral value that libertarian free market capitalist type people 
want to appeal to for the legitimacy of systems of private property, which is what, uh, how I'm going to understand capitalism for the purposes of this lecture. Um, it's going to involve uh, systems, uh, social institutions of private property coupled with um, free markets where people are not restricted from their ability to participate in the market or what they do with that. Um, one quick, 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 quick second here. So we're going to see from Cohen a really, um, I would say, kind of even-handed presentation of this w without pulling his punches. He's not just, like I said, watering down a Marxist critique of capitalism or throwing it some bones to be a moderate or something like that. I mean, this is, this is a really um, him invading his opponent's home territory, really. So, um, very interesting stuff. Um, and in terms of locating ourselves here, uh, just as a reminder, I mean, this is part of the unit with um, Rawls and Nozick. And what we've been talking about in this unit is kind of rethinking the foundational institutional rules that define our society, that make it up. Both Rawls wanted to talk about that, Nozick wanted to talk about that, both of them are like, you can't take the status quo for granted. And we can think about lots of other possible ways in which things could be. And maybe there are some other ways in which society could be organized that would be more just. And what would be the standards that would let us know that? Cohen's doing something very similar, but a little bit more narrow, because now we're just thinking about one, one aspect, but a pretty big aspect of uh, what our social institutions might look like, and that is uh, the the institutions of private property. So property ownership itself. Okay. Um, oh man, uh, my family decided to start having a text conversation, so I'm getting beep beep beeps. If it keeps going, I will mute it. Sorry for the annoyance. I still want to see if there's that student that wants to hook up with us. Okay. So, um, any questions so far from chat? Uh, keep in mind tonight, I mean, I'm always like pestering you guys about ask all the questions you got, but um, I, I, like I said at the beginning of the, the lecture, I'm very familiar with Cohen getting misunderstood here. And the I can do a lot more in helping, I can anticipate some of those things and try to head them off in my lecture, what, I plan, what I'm planning on talking about. But the more that you can ask those questions, don't be afraid of revealing your ignorance or it, maybe you're misunderstanding Cohen or something like that. Let's work it out so we can understand just what he's saying. Um, and bring objections. I think um, the kinds of, I, here's, a, here's a little anecdotal example. I had a student in my other section, yeah this is actually, I'll, I'll, I'm going to share two anecdotes about this. I had two students in my other section sign up to do presentations on Cohen. And in that version of the class, all the presentations are oral in class. They're not, you guys have been typing them up and uploading them to Canvas. But we would, we uh, in the other class are doing them in class. One student uh, saw my lecture. They didn't talk to me ahead of time, like I've been encouraging. Um, they saw my lecture and they pulled me aside during the break in the uh, halfway between class and they're like, Tim, I don't want to give my presentation because I totally misunderstood what Cohen was saying. So his entire presentation was like, didn't make any sense because of the misunderstanding. I had another student who uh, did talk to me before doing their presentation, thank goodness. And um, when we had that conversation, they had a bunch of misconceptions, but we were able to sort it out pretty fast on the phone call because he was like, so here's what I'm planning on saying. Like, this argument seems like bullshit to me. This one doesn't make any sense. I'm like, uh, no way. And then I talked through, uh, seeing what kinds of concerns he had, I was able to talk through, here's how Cohen's trying to respond to that concern. And that helped to illustrate and understand what Cohen's actually defending and how he's trying to defend it. So chat, really, as always, and especially now, I would really, really love uh, you to be open on the, be active in the, um, the chat bar. Um, I think uh, sometimes the typing slows things down a little bit and I'm just kind of like staring into this while people are typing. So what I might do is as things are going, just I'll keep going. I'll see that you're typing something in the chat and I'll just keep lecturing. And then when it pops up, then I'll respond to it. Um, let's do things that way. But please do not hesitate in the slightest about asking questions or you know, saying what you think doesn't make sense. If something just strikes you as completely nonsensical, then chances are there's something more to the story for us to talk about. But 
Um, it's also very possible. Another thing I'm familiar with with this lecture and with Cohen is that students are not initially sympathetic at all. And I don't mean to sound like I'm going to try to like sell you on Cohen or something like that. But I'm going to be doing everything I can to make it clear what is the logic that he's employing. And and ultimately, it's it's fairly simple logic. The paper is complicated, um, but that's because the way we talk about it is complicated. The underlying points that he wants to make, I think, are pretty intuitive. Okay, I'm going to silence my phone so that my family doesn't bother us anymore. <laughs> Okay. Oh, my Lord. All right. So, people in chat, anything that you want to ask about before I go any further? That was introduction time over. We're ready to hit the ground running with the nuts and bolts. How are we doing? Hello? Is our people there? Doing all right so far? Anybody? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, again, it always makes me feel like I'm not just talking into a box. But I think it'll, it'll be beneficial to you too. Um, okay, so let's get started here. Um, we're going to begin. Oops, that was. Is that what I. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, there we go. And get my little window here. There we go. All right. So, um, if you're following along uh, in the chat, um, if you're watching live tonight, uh, I do recommend pulling up my lecture notes. Um, this one is complicated. Uh, Cohen has split his paper into six movements that each have their kind of major point to make. They're another piece of the puzzle of the overall argument here, which again, the, the destination here where Cohen's trying to take us is uh, a conclusion that says that um, communally held property provides more opportunities for freedom of the same kind that capitalism offers, but more. So it, it is superior to uh, capitalism, to a system of private property with free markets. Um, it gives you more freedom than they can, than that thing can. That's where this is all going. And that might sound like, what? <laughs> but that's why we're going to have to take this piece by piece. Okay. So and I say at the beginning of my lecture notes, uh, Cohen is a dirty, dirty socialist. And what I just mean is kind of like what I was saying earlier, he's not some kind of softball Marxist. I mean, he's he's straight up. Um, so this isn't, you know, if, if socialism is a bad word to you, you're not going to like Cohen. But that doesn't mean you maybe shouldn't. Like, maybe his arguments are convincing. But it, it's just to alert you that there there isn't some kind of uh, pseudo-capitalism Marxism thing going on here. However, I will say this. Um, and maybe this will be useful uh, to just even open up with in terms of where Cohen is going. Cohen is not the kind of person who is advocating for something like Stalinist communism, uh, like no no kind of totalitarian sort of regime here. And I think that's worth pointing out. I mean, anytime you talk about Marxism with Americans, they immediately think of Soviet Russia or China and think about all the genocide and all the oppression and the lack of civil liberties and basically the complete absence of democracy. And that is not what Cohen is trying to defend, and it's wrong to associate that with Marxism or with communism. Those are particular versions of communism, have a whole lot of other crap on top of them. Marx is not down with what Stalin ends up doing, not at all. Um, or the Cultural Revolution. I mean, there's some parts that are similar, but there's a lot of other things that are tacked onto that. Um, so we don't have, it'd be like, someone uh, criticizing capitalism by just looking at uh, like organized crime or something like that. I mean, this is, there are corrupt and bad versions of just about every plan of uh, social systems or social institutions. 
Um, so we got to think about this a little, little more open-minded than that, of just restricting to those kinds of models. In fact, in particular here, Marx is actually quite a big fan of democracy. Um, there, he has, well, I should put it this way, he has um, democratic instincts. So one of the big things that he wants is that instead of laborers having to uh, basically sell their labor to the people who own the means of production, who have the jobs to offer, um, they uh, they own the means of production together. So it would be like the farmers who are working the land own the land that they're working on, like collectively. Or the workers in the factory own the factory. And they make decisions about how that's run. So it's even more democratic um, than the way things work with private ownership, where basically the owner is like the king, right? They have the complete control. That's compromised a little bit with things like corporations, as we've talked about before. There is uh, no one who sort of holds all the strings, or is yeah, pulling all the strings with zero accountability. Um, but there, those kinds of uh, aspects of Marx are democratic in their nature, and a lot of modern Marxists are very interested in uh, this integration of communism and democracy. They think that uh, communist systems can uphold democratic principles. So keep that in mind too. Um, Stalinist Russia is a straw man for communism. I, I think that's the quickest way I can put it. Um, so Cohen, for his part, he's, I could put it, another way I can put his sort of final position is that he's interested not in everything being communally held, but us being open to recognizing how the more things that are communally held, the more options we might have for expanding our freedoms. But because he's going to be appealing to freedom as the grounds for doing so, any sort of scenario that you imagine where things being communally held would not promote freedom is actually something Cohen's not interested in. He wouldn't be interested in defending that. So he's not. this isn't an all-or-nothing sort of thing. In fact, right now, we have a pseudo capitalist system. I mean, it's not completely. It's got socialist elements in it. It's actually got a lot of socialist elements in it. Um, one of my students remarked this afternoon after the lecture that they were like, I didn't realize um, how much the thing that Cohen is describing as communally held property is actually all around us already. It's actually not that foreign to Americans to imagine things like these socialist systems or these uh, systems of communally held property. Um, so that that might also be useful. Okay, but let's get into this in the details. Sorry, there's so much to talk about. I, I'm going to have to keep a check on how this lecture goes and whether it gets out of control. The first section of the paper is one of the most challenging, right to begin with. Um, I'm calling this in my lecture notes a hardcore analytic hair splitting on the concept of freedom, trying to define what it, are we talking about? We're going to be appealing to this moral value of freedom in this paper, in this argu series of arguments, and Cohen's like, let's get straight on what we're talking about here. And his first like big surprising claim here is to say that one is in general free to do whatever one is forced to do. So in other words, if you're forced to do something, then you have to be able to do it. You can't be forced to do things that you're not able to do. And if you're able to do it, you got to be free to do it. If you're not free to do something, then you're not able to do it. Okay? So um, freedom here is sort of like the availability, the, the availability or the accessibility of a course of action. Um, I actually am going to encourage throughout the paper thinking about freedom here in terms of access to actions. Is there a certain action that I have access to that's available for me to choose? That's how we're going to understand freedom. What are the things, what are the actions that are available for me to engage in? Um, that's going to be the understanding of freedom. Um, the, as a little clarification, he says, just because you're free to do something doesn't mean you're able to do it. Like he talks about how in, a, in he's from Britain, so he's thinking... In his society, there's no law that says you can't swim the English Channel. Like, you're allowed to do that. 
right? Society allows that. It makes it available. You have the free choice to be able to make that attempt. But just because it's an open option as far as society is concerned doesn't mean you're in fact able to actually swim the English Channel. Your muscles might fail you, right? You, might, you just don't have the power to do it. But the question we're interested in is what options are available for you to take? What are the ones that really um, you can take? Okay, and what, and eventually we're, we'll get to what's the value of those options too. Um, but when we're thinking about just like what is freedom, it's about options available for choice. Um, so he says, I love this example. Uh, even though it might sound surprising that if you're forced to do something, whatever you're forced to do, you're free to do. Why? Even it might sound funny. But it really makes sense. And the example that really, and I think, puts the nail in the coffin for this is his example of someone blackmailing somebody else. Like, let's say you're um, blackmailing me. You've um, kidnapped my child, and you're, like, holding it for ransom. And there's something terrible that you want me to do. Like, well, <laughs> I was going to say something like, you want me to kill somebody else. But this afternoon, um, when I was thinking about an example for this, um, I thought of, uh, you kidnap my child to blackmail, blackmail me to give you an A in the class. So maybe you're otherwise like failing the class and you're getting desperate. You really need that A. So you kidnap my kid and, and blackmail me. And I'm thinking, probably, I don't know what I'd do in that case. That'd be really tricky. I mean, obviously my child matters more. But let's say I'm like, I don't want to have to make one choice or the other. I don't want, I, de I definitely don't want to do something that harms my child. I also want to protect the, my professional ethics, the integrity of my professional ethics. So Cohen's saying, there's an out. There's a way you can escape this dilemma. Tim, you could say, go rob a 7-Eleven and get arrested. They'll put you in jail, and now you'll be in jail when grades are due in a week and a half, and you won't be able to give them an A. So as soon as I'm put into jail and I'm no longer free to do those actions, then I can't be forced to do them. Your blackmailing gambit fails. You can't force me to do something I can't do, that I'm not free to do. So um, the reason why he's talking about this is because of a way in which Marxists and capitalists talk past each other. A way in which, or I, I'm going to say Marxists, I, I could also say social liberals, um, and by capitalists, I could also say libertarians. I'm going to use these terms probably interchangeably. I try to stay consistent, but I'm, I'm sure I won't. <laughs> but you can think of those as like the two camps, um, roughly speaking, for the purposes of our lecture tonight. And those two camps talk about freedom in different ways or put different emphasis on it that makes them kind of talk past each other. And one of the first interesting signs we're going to get from Cohen here that he's not just plug in Marxism away against these capitalist opponents um, is that he actually sides with the capitalists here. He thinks they have the proper conception of freedom. So go to this situation where um, it's a recession. I own a factory. I own a means of production. Means of production is just like the control of the resources that the entire economic engine is fueled by. So a factory produces products, right? So it's a means of production. So I own the factory, so I got the jobs. And it's a recession, so all of you are unemployed. You need work. I know this. So I offer extremely low wages and know that you're going to take them. Because what else are you going to do? You're going to starve, right? The demand for the jobs is so high, <laughs> and there's a limited supply, and I'm the one with the supply, so I can take advantage of this under a kind of capitalist system. Capitalism wants to say, yeah, you got freedom there. And Cohen wants to say, yep, that's exactly right. Marxists usually want to say about this situation something like, those laborers' freedoms are being taken away. This kind of coercive aspect of how their weak position is being leveraged against them in the market, they're like, this is why markets take away freedom. This kind of, That's how what Marxists usually want to say. And Cohen's like, nah, that doesn't make sense, man. It just doesn't make sense. Because if you're being forced to do something, like forced to take those jobs that I have at low wages, that's got to be something that you're actually free to do. It's not like the capitalist uh, factory owner, me in this situation, is chaining you to the factory floor and forcing you to work as a slave. It's, it's not a situation like that. Under capitalism, 
you are free to take the job or leave it. It's your choice. You can choose either one. Both choices are available choices for you to make. Now, there's consequences that attach to them, and we will get to that. Don't worry. Cohen is not insensitive to that. Um, but he wants to acknowledge and sort of grant to the opponent here, the capitalist opponent, that, yeah, this is a case of freedom. Where Cohen thinks the, the capitalists go wrong is in thinking because this is a case of freedom you get to decide no one's holding the gun to your head about whether you're going to take the job or leave the job um, that therefore there can't be any coercion involved and he's like no both of these things are compatible you can be free to do something and coerced to do it at the same time and we're concerned about that so uh, coercion is something else that's morally relevant here and actually the coercion the the you know trying to articulate like what's morally wrong about that what's morally wrong about this coercive use um of like taking advantage of my position of strength in this negotiation and your position of weakness cohen will have an ability to make sense of that um using the language of freedom itself so we will we will get there um but the the bottom line here for this section is that cohen is actually citing He's playing, like I said, he's playing on the capitalist home turf, and he's using their definitions, and he, and he thinks they're actually correct. I mean, he thinks they make the most philosophical sense to say that what freedom really is, is the accessibility of an option for action. Like, you can take the job, you can leave it. Both are options. Now, practically speaking, the person who's in, who's in your position here probably doesn't feel like they have a choice, but that's just because the reasons weighs so heavily in favor of one of them, right? And actually, a lot of coercive action requires rationality on the part of the victim. If I hold you up like I'm mugging you with a gun and I say, your wallet or your life, and you go, fine, kill me, I don't fucking care. Here, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna give you my wallet, kill me. I'll be like, well, shoot, that failed, <laughs> right? The whole point of the, the threat is that, of course, your life is more valuable than your wallet. And if you're too irrational to be able to connect the dots on that, then the threat will fail, right? So coercion always relies on rationality, which implies that there are good reasons. So when someone says they don't have a choice, Cohen is saying, you do have a choice, and we got to grant that. I'm not saying that that's okay or morally permissible, but we do need to acknowledge that what's going on here is freedom. Okay, so... Um, stay tuned. I'm sure there's a lot of other little hanging threads or reactions you might have about that, but um, this is the starting point for the conversation. Um, uh, and, oh, a little side note here before we leave this. Um, so Cohen thinks when... Um, oh, so yeah, what I just said, basically. When laborers are strong-armed into selling their labor in order to make a livelihood, right? They don't have any other means of income or way of supporting themselves, so they have to work. Um, they have to take jobs. Um, Cohen wants to grant, yep, they're still enjoying the freedoms of capitalism. You know, that's they get to participate in a free market. They're not feudal serfs, right? They're not slaves. Um, and we might say about that that Rawls might say, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but in addition to freedom, we want fairness, right? Rawls was really concerned about how these negotiations that happen, free consensual agreements, are still under the auspices of these power inequalities that make it not a fair negotiation. And that's why he has the veil of ignorance. You know, that whole thing, that whole thought experiment is designed to get us into a negotiating position where we can't, where no one can like leverage in the debate over what justice should be. Justice won't be a football kicked around just for people to improve their personal positions. Okay, um, that when we can't leverage our individual circumstances, whether that's a position of weakness or strength, we don't have those biases going on, then our rational discussion about the rules for social justice will be actually authoritative and productive. It'll be more of a truth-seeking conversation. And we'll figure out what is truly rationally justified as a proper conception of social justice. That's a quick summary of Rawls again. Um, so Rawls might might step in and say something like that to this. He might he, he's probably still going to agree with Cohen here. Yeah, there's a kind of freedom, but there's something else. Freedom is not the only criteria of social justice. It's also fairness. Um, Cohen doesn't take quite this route. I mean, he doesn't bring up Rawls here, um, but I think it's kind of interesting to think about 
how compatible are they going to step on each other's toes what's going to happen there um, two very different ways of uh, addressing some of the same problems about capitalism but in, in very different philosophies uh, very different contexts for the argument okay um, <clears throat> definitely want to check in here at this point with chat I haven't seen any comments pop up here uh, as we've been going I think I've said some provocative things I don't know if it's provoked any reactions in you because um, I can't see your faces my afternoon class it was always fun to give this lecture because I see people's faces just go like Ugh, or like <gasps> Or like, ah, or like all these weird things happen. Um, so how are things going so far? Is this first, I, I mean, this is a tricky paper. I'm trying to do my best to make it accessible, to illuminate what's happening in the text. Is that happening? How are we doing so far? Trying to understand, are there still some things that are a little shaky? Makes more sense now? Okay. I mean, Maybe I'll just talk about it a little bit more in the hopes that that helps create even more uh, of a sharp vision here of, of what um, Cohen's throwing down. The the really big point that's going to be relevant going from this first section onto the entire rest of the paper is how our way of understanding freedom is really like what actions are available for me to take. What are live options? I may not choose them, but they're available for me to take. Like. My uh, neighbor here has a dirt bike, right? I don't like dirt bikes. I don't have a license um, to ride one. I have no interest in spending money on that, um, taking those risks with my body. I think I'm a, probably a terrible driver at this point. Um, I'm a little too scatterbrained and absent-minded to probably operate any serious machine. Um, but I have the freedom to. I could. Nothing, no one's stopping me. There's no law. There's no social rule or cultural thing that stops me from going down to the DMV, getting a license, or like, you know, getting trained, going down, getting a license, um, spending money to buy one. Um, I could do that. Um, and then I would have a bike. Now, I'm not going to take that option, but I have the freedom to do it. It's a live option. Um, you have freedom in these classes. You took this class um, and while it was required for the program, so you didn't get the option of saying I want to do this program but not take the business ethics component of it while that was forced on you, um, you did have the choice whether you wanted to uh, go to, into this program or not. Um, that was the the option to apply was available to you. Now maybe, I, I mean BC is open enrollment so you don't, it's, it's not like other schools is selective application process but even at those schools everyone is free to apply whether they're gonna get a position is another thing um, but that is the freedom that they get they have access to that right so freedoms are are really about like what options are available to you not which option makes the most sense for your self-interest or something like that and that's why I tried to distinguish it uh, that's why I was trying to distinguish in the case about the factory owner uh, me as the factory owner you wanting the jobs that um, because of the practical needs of survival, putting food on the plate for you and your family, you're going to take the job for low wages because it's better than nothing, right? Um, but it is still a choice, and you're choosing based on those practical reasons. Um, the option to not choose that is available, okay? It is available. And that's what capitalism is claiming, right? Everyone's free. This market is not shut out for some people and not others. That's the promise of it. In practice, it doesn't always work this way. But like in the sense of um, lingering racism and sexism, like those kinds of traditional discriminations are shutting out people's accesses, and that's why we call it a civil liberties issue, right? It's a, it's a matter of people's freedom, that there's some things that they don't have options for. Um, Walter says, coercion works when rational. 
equals when an unfavorable choice is forced on you, you have the freedom to participate or not. Yes. Yeah. Coercion requires freedom. That's the main point that Cohen's trying to make here. Um, so you, you're talking about me, may own the factory jobs, but with the power in numbers, everyone can agree that this is not the freedom we choose to participate in opening up a type of social negotiation. Um, some things about the sentence there, the grammar there that I'm, I'm having some trouble with. I may own the factory, but with the power in numbers, everyone can agree that it's not the freedom we choose to participate in opening up a kind of social negotiation. It sounds like you're maybe thinking about a scenario in which the rules of capitalism are upset, like a communist revolution. The workers rise up against their oppressors, the factory owners, right? Is that what you're thinking? Yes, right. So that's a totally different thing. That's a totally different system. We're talking about within the constraints of capitalism. So capitalists want to say, hey, one of the reasons for doing capitalism is freedom. Free markets. Anyone can participate, right? You, No one's going to be weeded out. If you got something that you own, you can sell it. If you've got money, you can buy whatever's out there. You're able to bid for it as much as anybody else, right? You get to, there's, it's open, unrestricted participation in economic activity. That is, um, that's, that's the promise of capitalism as a vehicle for freedom. What Cohen wants to say is that, yeah, you've got those freedoms. And it also might mean coercion. Coercion is still possible even within a system like that that's giving you all those freedoms. Um, the freedom about like being able to rise up and rewrite the social order is not about freedom in the constraints of a social institution. That's about destroying them, right? And we're going to talk about that. Um, is there more freedom in a system where all the social rules are destroyed? And the answer is no. Cohen does not think that that's the case. And no will, and neither will any reasonable libertarian either. Am I kind of addressing what your comment was, Walter? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the real context for the debate is capitalism versus communism. Uh, systems of private property ownership versus systems of communal property ownership. That That's the world that we're, we're thinking about here. But I'm going to talk about anarchy here in a second. Okay. So, if anything else is going on for people, drop it in the comments. Even if it's like a few minutes back or something like that, don't feel shy about dropping it in. Um, we can always come back to it and circle back around. Okay. So here's <clears throat> the second movement of the article. And this is really big for opening up the main argument that Cohen wants to make. So he wants to debunk a myth. And it's a myth that he thinks both libertarians and social liberals or socialists or communists or Marxists actually buy into. Um, so here's a definition of libertarianism that is in a philosophical dictionary by a professional philosopher that Cohen's going to be like, this is a terrible definition. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This is the myth. So libertarianism by this philosopher Flew is defined as wholehearted political and economic liberalism opposed to any social or legal constraints on individual freedom. Cohen's going to say that's just bullshit. That's just a lie. That is, a, as he says, a misuse of the concept of freedom. Okay, let me give you some backdrop for this. And actually, I can pull up the whole thing. Let me give you some backdrop. So I told you Cohen's weird. He's approaching this conversation in a different way than many, many, many other people. <clears throat> and the usual way that this is set up is, on the one hand, on the one hand, you've got the libertarians, who are all about free market economy, zero regulations or as minimal regulations from the government as conceivably possible. We cannot eliminate the government because we need something that's going to make this whole thing work. Um, but we want it to be as small and tiny as possible. Okay, so that's the libertarian position. On the other hand, you've got uh, social liberals, socialists, communists, Marxists. All of these people are arguing for things like much bigger government, social programs like welfare programs, um, universal health care, maybe universal basic income, um, all these subsidies for free education, like all this kind of stuff. Like the state is going to provide all these kinds of um, options for people's well to improve their well-being. And usually how the argument between these two sides go is that 
the libertarian is said to be the, like, well, I should say this first, setting it up. Both sides agree. Freedom's a great thing. That's an important moral value. And both sides also agree well-being matters too. People's circumstances, their quality of life, their happiness is also something morally significant. What's ha if, you're, if half your citizenry is just in total suffering, and disease or something, right? Um, poverty, that's not good. That's, that's not a good society. This isn't an ideal situation, right? So, and both sides would agree to that. I mean, even libertarians are like, yeah, you know, we, we should be concerned morally about people who are suffering in society. They want people to privately take care of it rather than the state, but they're still morally concerned about it, right? They still think they're not, I guess I should be careful here. I've met some libertarians who are basically don't seem to have a compassionate bone in their body, but any reasonable libertarian here, if they're not a straw man, they're like, yeah. We got compassion for people suffering. We're concerned about their quality of life. That matters too. But how this debate is usually framed is that when the shit hits a fan and you can't have your cake and eat it too, it's the libertarian who's going to prioritize the moral value of liberty and freedom over well-being. So we are going to give people maximum freedom in society, maximum options for exerting their autonomy, even if it means some people are going to be falling through the cracks of society, and there's going to be higher poverty and unemployment and stuff like that. Basically, lower quality of life for some people. So be it, they say, right? They're not trying to hurt people, um, but if there's a situation where you can't have both values met, they're going to give the preference toward the freedom stuff. Whereas the social liberals do the opposite. They're like, yep, uh, we're going to you know, compromise people's freedoms and limit their autonomy for the sake of people's well-being. Which is where you get the straw man version of the social liberal who's like wanting to endorse some science fiction dystopia of a big brother state that controls everything and people have zero autonomy, but everyone's really happy, right? <laughs> um, that's, that's not what social liberals argue for too. They think freedom really matters, but in those places where you can't have both, they're willing to make a sacrifice for that. Like for say, for example, the T word, taxes. Right? Taxes take away from what people have. That means they don't have the freedom to do what they want with it. Right? And the government does this through force and basically the threat of violence. We've talked before about how uh, I, I kind of am partial to this definition of government because there's, there's some cases where what is the government is not obvious. Some cases in history, different parts of the world. And this is a useful definition when the usual models don't apply. Um, this definition that the government is whatever institutional system has the monopoly of violence in an area. And that's what the government does with taxes. They basically use the threat of violence, because they have the army and the cops, uh, for you to give up to them your possessions. And then they are going to use it. They're going to redistribute those resources or employ them in such a way that's going to be to people's benefit in terms of their well-being and increase their quality of life. Okay, So that's the way the debate is usually framed. And Cohen's like, what both sides are making the mistake in doing is thinking that it's the libertarian who's got the monopoly on the value of freedom. Basically that if you were undecided, right, if you're like, ah, oh, should I be a libertarian? Should I be a social liberal? But you're like, freedom is the thing I care about the most. Well, then obviously I've got to be a libertarian. Cohen's like, whoa, 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 not so fast about that. Social liberals, socialist Marxists, they don't have to concede the game so fast to the libertarian and saying that, like, if you care about freedom, well, this is maximum freedom. Cohen's not buying it. Um, Walter asks, uh, it sounds like libertarian ideas don't want to invest in rationality. Uh, that's not the way they talk about it. They usually want it the other way around. Um, that, like, rational agency being self-determining is why you're going to prioritize liberty, liberty considerations above all these other things. Um, I'm, I'm, but I'm curious, though, what's behind that question, the way you asked it. Because um, I might be taking it too literally and you're really digging at something else. What made you think that libertarians are not interested in investing in rationality? You picture a Wild West scenario. Okay. 
Wild West is anarchy. <laughs> Effectively. Like, like, um, uh, what was it? Oh, man. Great HBO show. Uh, Deadwood. Deadwood. Deadwood is, like, very tenuous social institutions, right? Um, it's really just a might makes right kind of scenario. And even the law that's involved is, like, the authority of the U.S. government means just about jack shit out there, right? <laughs> um, it really comes down to power. Um, so the libertarian is not arguing for that. And that is the first thing that Cohen's going to really point out about this. But um, so um, making sense, though, that the way the debate usually works is this is a question of which value do, do you prioritize over the other? I mean, it's, it's the classic debate. Uh, it's even a question I had on the questionnaire at the very beginning of the quarter for you of like, where are you coming from? What do you think is more important? Well-being, quality of life, or freedom and autonomy? And I got a lot of different answers. Um, and that's why it's a sticky debate. But Cohen's like, well, let's focus on just this part of the freedom thing. Even if maybe there's arguments here that Marxists might want to offer about why well-being is more important, takes a higher moral priority, something like that. He's like, do we need to cons do we need do we have to go there to defend it? Do we need to concede this value, the moral value, the freedom card, to the libertarian capitalist free market opponent? And he's thinking, no. So let's look at why. Um, so <clears throat> pure freedom would, in the context in which we've been defining freedom, as freedom is the availability of action, pure freedom would basically mean you're God. You're allowed to do everything. Or maybe like a tyrant or a king. In a social system in which you have a king, the king is allowed to do everything. Right? Nothing, um, or, <laughs> I don't want to bring up Trump here, but, um, you know, in the discussions around obstruction of justice and stuff like this, like, the president can't obstruct justice. There's, there's this theory that's been floated before. Nixon thought this sort of thing, too. Um, he can't obstruct justice because he is the law. He can't do illegal things because he represents the law. If he does it, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> there actually are some cases of executive powers that work this way. Like if the president says something in public, it is no longer classified. They they cannot break the rules about classified information because they have the highest say so about what is classified and what is not. Right. So, uh, but if you imagine those powers extended completely, right? Um, there is no there is no rule in the society that tells the king or queen no then they would have pure freedom. But the only way that happens is if there are tons of rules for everybody else, right? In order for the king or queen, the monarch, the dictator, the tyrant, to enjoy the expansive freedoms that they have, to do whatever they want, that has to involve other people not being able to do whatever they want to create that space for them. I can also attack this from the other direction. In a case of anarchy, then people are allowed to do whatever they want. Stealing, for example. You don't get a system of private property with anarchy. If you're going to have a system of private property, then there are rules that need to be put in place to protect that property. So the way that that looks in our society, which is a private property society, uh, at least mostly, um, if you steal something from me, like you steal a car or something like that, um, then you can be legally prosecuted for that. There are You have transgressed a social rule. You have done something that you are not allowed to do, that you are not free to do, and so that justifies all these other constraints. And if there wasn't that force of the government, that monopoly on violence force that they've got, those laws wouldn't mean anything. People wouldn't follow them if there wasn't any threat backing them up. People might follow them. I'm, I mean, I'm a, I'm a hippie about this. I... Kant's kingdom of ends and all that good stuff. But um, that's the, the, in the state of anarchy, there's no rules to violate. And to be able to protect a space of private property means that there are rules going on about that. Now, this is something that becomes invisible. And that's what Cohen thinks is largely to responsible, this like way in which those no sayings are invisible is why Cohen thinks we might make this confusion in the first place, that somehow libertarians are the ones who say 
freedom and nothing but freedom, you know, or complete freedom, that they could say something like that when they don't really mean it. When they're trying to justify a system of private property and free markets, that requires rules. <laughs> it's not it's not anarchy. Is this helping for you, Walter, with what your your lines of reflections were going? I actually have a wonderful little metaphor here too that might help. Massaging it out. Okay, Let, let's work with Cohen's metaphor, and then I'll use one of my own. Mine's a little more fun, but Cohen talks about you own your house, let's say, right? Um, and you have a yard, so you only you own the land. And someone homeless wants to pitch their tent on the on it and sleep back there because they have no other place to sleep, right? They're they're looking for a spot, and they're like, I'll just pitch my tent in your back lawn. Um, that would be something that you could call the cops on them for, right? If you if you chose to, you could let them stay out of the graciousness of your heart. You know, you could do that. But because of the laws that we have, because you are given private property rights over that land, you can tell them to fuck off and the cops will back you up. You'll have the full force of the United States government backing up that demand. Right. So for you to have the freedom to own that land means this other person does not have the freedom to pitch their tent there. It's a no saying. And a lot of times we're thinking about the yes sayings of private property. That it's I'm thinking about the things I would get to own. I'm thinking about the positive freedoms that it allows me to have. If I have private property ownership over something, then I am free to do things with it. Thinking back to freedom is meaning opportunity or access to action. There's things I can do with it that I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't own it. And so we're thinking, oh, if I own this thing, if I'm, if society allows me to own it, I get more freedom. But what's invisible to me is all of the no saying, the yes saying that I get, the freedoms that I get, the actions I get to perform once I get to own that thing, involves all of this no saying to everyone else in society. It's just like when we talked about human rights. Any notion of a right, if we want to say someone has a positive right to something, by saying that, you logically commit to there being obligations onto everyone else. So if I have a right to life, everyone else has an obligation not to kill me. That's a rule that's imposed on how they use their agency. They can't use it for that kind of thing, right? <clears throat> Same thing with private property, rights, property rights, right? It invokes an, an obligation on everyone else, not mess with it. Not without permission, not without some contractual commit, um, permission or, or you know agreement or transfer of property or something like that can you then gain access and thus have freedom to use that thing in the way that you want to okay so uh that's that's how cohen describes it i came up with this other metaphor this afternoon that i think fits really really nicely here so um i don't know how many of you know about dungeons and dragons or if you play games like this i'm not a big D D person um, I do like board games a lot. Dungeon crawlers are a common motif, or you play video games maybe like this or something like that. But imagine a kind of like sprawling dungeon, and the dungeon represents society, okay, in the metaphor. And every every part of the dungeon has gates everywhere with locks on them. The entire dungeon is just filled with locks. And the key to every door is exactly the same money so you got a bag of cash you got a bag of coins that you're carrying around with you in the dungeon and you as long as you got the coins you those you don't even recognize those doors are there I mean, just a minor inconvenience to walk right through if you had boatloads of cash you're basically free to explore the entire dungeon think kind of like play to play video games right <laughs> if you have all the money in the world to pay for these things then you can do whatever you want in them Right? You pay money through the paywall, it's no obstacle at all. You're free to traverse the dungeon wherever you want to go. If you don't have a bag of cash, then the entire dungeon is a prison. You're like, I'm trapped. Where, where can I go? I can't go anywhere. And I like this metaphor as a way of describing the world that we are living in today. It may be invisible to a lot of us. I, I think this is part of class privilege. That you don't recognize how everything in society is gated behind a paywall. Everything is saying no until you wave that magic wand, credit card or something, and 
and get through the gates. That's really what Cohen is saying about how capitalism functions. And it's not absurd. I mean, that's, that's just the bald truth of it, right? If you don't have the money, you don't get the access. So there are, there's all this inherent no saying, all these restrictions on freedom that are required in order to give people their property rights that they get the freedom to do what they want with that property. To give people that freedom means taking freedom away from everybody else. Now, is that fair or not? I had a lot of reactions in my afternoon class when I mentioned this part of the argument. And that's where we're going next, right? We're going we're gonna to talk about how to morally evaluate that. In the second section, Cohen's just saying, stop this talk, libertarians. Like, you're the ones who are providing no restrictions on people's autonomy. Your system of private property is imposing tons of restrictions on people's autonomy that otherwise they wouldn't have. Right? If it wasn't for private property rights, someone could just pitch the tent. They're free to do so. Now, we may not think that that's a desirable thing, and Cohen is not saying something like, let's have a society in which people can just sleep on your lawn whenever they want. I mean, that's, that's not what he's arguing for. But he's trying to point out how private property systems under capitalism, come on, bug, um, do have all of these restrictions on people's freedom, the access to action thing. Okay, how are we doing with that, chat? This is the other, like, n this is the next kind of, like, big idea. <clears throat> Good? Cool? Thank you for the positive feedback, Leticia. I always appreciate that. Cool. Awesome, Theo. All right. Oh, there's um one more thing I need to say about this section I forgot. Here, going back to the lecture notes here. Um, <clears throat> so there's another way in which a libertarian might try to, you know, dig in and say, no, 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 no. There's a very fair way in which we can talk about how private property systems um, are not uh, are giving people maximum freedom, but it involves changing the definition of freedom, specifically to moralize it, to say um, freedom is only violated when um, there's an interference with someone's autonomy that's unjustified. And you take that idea and couple with it an assumption that private property rights are justified and saying something like, um, you're not taking away someone's freedom when you tell them to get off my lawn. Um, Cohen thinks this is just a really dumb definition for freedom. This makes no sense because it would imply that prisoners are totally free, that they don't have any restrictions on their freedom, like people who are in jail. Why? Because they're being justly interfered with. And so he's like, no, that doesn't make sense. Also, the deeper problem here is that if the libertarian wants to define freedom in a way that is talking about moralized freedom, that's putting this moral condition on uh, the interference doesn't violate freedom if it's a just interference, this kind of thing, the bringing that justice condition in there, basically prevents them from being able to appeal to freedom as a reason to think property rights are justified, right? Um, that would be basically a circular argument. Okay? If they're saying freedom is what justifies private property rights, but by freedom we mean things that uh, are consistent with private property rights being just, game over. Right? That's just This is true because it's true. <laughs> it's about as tight of a circle, about as blatant a question-begging argument as you could ever imagine. So Cohen's like, no one should be saying this. This is a dead end. Let's stick back to the basic idea of freedom that capitalists and libertarians started with. The idea of freedom is opportunity of choice, accessibility of options for choice. That's what we mean by it. So let's keep that thin definition, not moralize it. Um, that was another tricky part of the paper. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't want to dwell on that part too much, though. Um, there's plenty of other fish here for us to fry. Um, but I think this is a good time to take a break. Um, we're, we're kind of done with the setup. Now things are going to get interesting. I'm going to get a little in, more closer to Cohen making his substantive arguments in favor of uh, communally held properties. Um, so let's take a little break. People in chat, if some questions have popped up at this point, um, please drop them into the chat uh, and we can try to shore things up before I plow ahead with some more material. All right, see you in a little bit. Thanks, Walter. Okay, so... Getting back into the next section here. So the third section um, is when Cohen's talking about a particular type of freedom, economic freedom. 
that maybe capitalism has uh, a claim to make about how it's offering more freedoms uh, in terms of economic freedom um, and that's like the main sort of freedom that matters to the libertarian or something like that right that all these other no sayings of access of like saying you don't have access to these other things um, that's not the main sort of freedom that we're like morally interested in or something like that so let's let's talk about economic freedom itself which would so to try to restrict the conversation to just that that at least you know capitalism can say you have more freedom with economic freedom in free markets than you do in say something like communism um, that doesn't have those unregulated market things going on and this means that we're talking about the the particular freedoms uh, remember again our definition for freedom here is uh, available options right available access to actions that you could take that are viable choices or not I shouldn't say viable they're just choices that are available to you okay um, so we're talking specifically about access to buying and selling behaviors, buying and selling actions, which is what is sort of the promise of the free market, right? I can go out there. If I got something I own, I can sell it. I can put it out there on the market. If something's out there on the market, I can buy it as long as I have the money. So Cohen wants to, again, kind of really push home this point about the restrictions that private property systems like capitalism have on freedom that are just baked into how they operate and to, to try to make that invisible aspect visible which by the way um, that whole point about the invisible boundaries of private property and I was talking about how it to someone who doesn't have a lot of money who doesn't have a lot of means um, all they see are the notes like and what I sort of had in mind here is how people in poverty basically see that very clearly and people who are not in poverty don't see it because they're just all they're seeing is like I got look at all this freedom I can get through this gate I can get through this guy I don't even I barely even bat an eye at seeing the access that I'm able to get through the use of my money um, that if I if I have my house right I don't want to pinch a 10 on your house why would I care to have that option I don't want to have that option it's, it, so maybe there's a no saying there, but it's not one that I'm confronted with, and so I have to acknowledge its existence. I can kind of pretend like it isn't there. This pattern shows up, this like invisibleness, shows up with almost any kind of notion of privilege that we would want to talk about, um, including other kinds of cultural privileges. I think it really makes a lot of sense, maybe there's a little bit of this hat turning, I think it makes a lot of sense to understand privilege in terms of what options are available to you that especially other people might not have, right? Um, unequal access is the concerns about the, why something like privilege is morally concerning to us. And anyone who talks about privilege, if you've heard these discussions for like five minutes, um, usually this point gets brought up about how people that enjoy that privilege, it's invisible to them. And that's definitely happening in this situation too. So Cohen is just trying to make what's invisible visible so we can evaluate it fairly and think about comparison with say other possible options so um he's he's like okay fine okay libertarian you want to talk about economic freedom let's restrict our conversation to that and he says there's three major points here to show how there still are plenty of restrictions involved the first one is the kind of point i've been making that and it's just an obvious trivial point it's like impossible to argue with this under a free market economy you're only actually free the your actual practical freedom the options you are able to take based on the rules are you can only buy things that you can pay for if you don't have the money you can't buy it now there is still the kind of in principle on paper idea that were you to have the money the rules of society are set up in a way that you could buy it All right so you're not being excluded from the market but if you don't have the money you don't have that as an option that's the first kind of point and the second flip side point of that is if you don't own something you cannot sell it I cannot sell your property on eBay or something right that's it's and these are obvious trivial points about how capitalism functions or how private property systems function but they are they are worth remarking on or observing the second point is very similar to this but slightly different a little more complicated and this is Cohen's point that um, even if you have the means to say buy something or sell something the consequences of that choice are different how they they affect your decision matrix 
is not the same for different people, especially in terms of people who have more means and people who have less means, haves and have nots, if you will, that kind of thing. Um, let's say, like right now, could I buy a, a bike? Yes. <laughs> what would buying that bike mean for me in my situation with my income? It would mean I might not be able to put food on the table for my family, honestly, if I made that decision, right? So I could do it. It is an option I am free to take. But the consequences that attach to me doing that are different than, say, I don't know, like an Amazon employee that's making six figures a year. But for them to buy a bike, it's like, sure, why not? Um, a couple other anecdotal examples came up in class today. Um, I was just talking with a student around campus this week, and she was all jazzed because she bought tickets for um, she bought a ticket for a big music festival that's happening, and she was so happy that she paid. I it was some ridiculous number, like sixteen hundred dollars for this ticket because it's like right on the edge of the concert happening, this big festival happening. So for her to get a ticket that price, she was like enthused about. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I bought a, a concert ticket for 1600 bucks, that's like a month of eating for my fam me and my family, right? Um, that choice has very different consequences for me than it does for her, right? Um, or another student brought up today in class uh, that they were like, they bought a PS4 and then they just weren't using it, so they gave it to a friend. Right? For me, if I bought a PS4, that'd be a serious decision. I'd have to think about it, right? So it's worth recognizing how when it comes to what we are free to do or how we think about exerting our freedom in a practical, actual sense, that we're in different positions um, in terms of what the consequences of those choices mean. And the third one, and this is this is starting transition into some uh, the kind of material that Cohen wants to make a really substantive argument about, is he says not all freedoms are created equal. Kind of based on this point of how, depending on my circumstances, the meaning or value of a choice could definitely differ. If I'm buying this thing, that means I'm not buying food, maybe, right? That's a much different choice than when I just have oodles of expendable income. And it's just a matter of like, well, what will like please me the most or something like that. That's a very different kind of choice. This, um, what he's trying to draw attention to is how freedoms themselves are not all equally morally valuable. And in particular, and this was something uh, Dario sent me a text about a few minutes ago. Um, Cohen says, if I care to have economic freedoms, like if those matter to me, if there's something that I value, that I want to be able to buy and sell something, um, that's probably not because of my interest in economic freedom itself, the freedom to take this action of buy and sell, buying and selling. I don't think of it as having intrinsic value. I think about it as valuable because it gives me access to the other things that I want to be doing. Um, like Cohen brings up healthcare. It really matters if I'm included or excluded in the market of healthcare services because of my interest in getting healthcare, right? But he says, what if healthcare was available in an in an alternative way that didn't require buying and selling? What if there was public healthcare? Now my interest in buying and selling it on the market like maybe evaporates entirely. And we actually saw this phenomenon happen in the last couple of years. Um, maybe you saw these. Uh, I might have even brought it up in class before. These town halls in like really red districts, like very Republican conservative districts, where conservative representatives were getting bad mouthed and booed, and everyone was like not happy because they were talking about trying to repeal Obamacare. And you know, a few years back, this would have been like really surprising, right? Um, people didn't want to have public health care, mostly because they were worried about whether that would mean they don't have access to the health care that they actually desire. And they cared about private market access because they thought that that would give them better health care. Now that they actually have Obamacare and they're like, I'm getting the care that I value um, in, in a way that gives me more access to it. Now to say, oh, let's, uh, let's deal with this huge infringement on citizens' freedom and open up the markets again for this as a like a private transaction thing and get rid of the public thing people are like hell no right <laughs> um it was very uh it was there's some striking moments that happened about that um so the point is that 
there is an intrinsic value about the economic freedoms, the freedoms to buy and sell themselves. It's all about a means for what are the other freedoms that buying and selling gives us access to. Okay? We want freedom to do the buying and selling only if that's what we need as a, as a means of procuring these other kinds of um, freedoms, having access to these other kinds of freedoms. Daria, am I getting at what you were wondering about? I, I told you that we'd be talking about it. Let me know if that sort of settles it for you, or if you still had leftover questions about that. Yeah, I like this quote here from um, Cohen. He says, it is scarcely intelligible that one should be interested in how much freedom people have in a certain form of society without being interested in how readily they are able to exercise it. That that's the real thing that matters. Um, okay. Any any questions from that unit? We're, I'm about ready to go on to, to the uh, section four of the paper. Doing good? This idea that some freedoms might matter more than others, or that our interest in economic freedom is derivative of our interest in certain other types of freedoms, is going to make a big comeback here in a little bit. Mm, mm. Oh, that's right. I muted my speakers. Oh, sorry about that, Daria. Okay. I can hear you now. It depends on the circumstance for Cohen, um, but in many cases, no, that's going to be his point. So that this thing that he's introducing as a seed of an idea right now, he's going to leverage as a part of his main arguments later. Okay. That the, the common currency here for evaluating capitalism versus communally held properties, private property versus communally held property, um, is going to be this freedom thing. And freedom is a matter of access available actions that are choices for me to take um, so if I can get more of those things through communally held property than privately held property systems then that's going to be morally preferable here if what we care about is freedom and that's like the summary of the logic of the entire paper right there but in other cases, I mean, I think Cohen is very much open to certain circumstances or certain cases in which private property is the thing that makes the most sense. That it, it that there are freedoms that it uh, makes possible that are more um, important to prioritize than the freedoms that are involved in a communally held thing. And I'll, I'll give a couple examples of that that I think Cohen would agree to. Good? Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. okay, okay. Keep that on the back burner if there's something more to that thread, because there might be. Okay. So in section four, Cohen is um, doing something that I think is extremely wise for him to do, given all that stuff I was saying at the beginning of the lecture about how he's, he's really playing on his opponent's home turf. And not only that, but he's trying to speak to them, right? He's trying to engage with their concerns and to use even the conceptual language that uh, his libertarian free market capitalist opponent is uh, is comfortable with. Um, and not just as a matter of rhetoric, but in terms of the actual substance of it, the conceptual vocabulary that's involved here. One of the most common arguments um, that gets brought up against Marxism is how Marx calls for uh, a revolution, right? Um, that the workers need to rise up against their oppressors and overthrow the government and displace all the wealthy elite people, the bourgeois, and um, and basically take control of the reins of society. And in any sort of rapid uprising or social shift like that, where all the social institutions are flipped on their heads, um, that's going to involve a lot of conflict. And not just that, not just and not just the suffering that results from it much less violence, um, but the restrictions on people's freedoms. 
And that's why Cohen is not advocating for a communist revolution. <laughs> that is not the thing he's trying to justify. And actually, I think his whole paper belies a very different strategy, that he thinks, uh, I need to change hearts and minds. we got to convince people that actually there is more freedom in com communally held property systems than private property systems so that people freely choose to uh, and democratically choose to embrace that system um, rather than have it forced on them through violence uh, or the threat of violence. Um, Cohen says one of the biggest things that might inhibit something like communism from actually granting people freedom is that they don't believe it's going to grant them freedom. And that's exactly what we've got in America. I mean, so much so that socialism is a dirty word. Just this week, it, you know, Bernie Sanders is, you know, out there and he's been out there for a while about this. He's unabashed about saying that he's uh, a socialist. But you just have this laund laundry list of all the other Democratic candidates for president being like, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a socialist. I love capitalism. Freedom. Yes. Right. They're very quick to to say that because it's so politically risky. Um, ca uh, it's like a, socialism is a dirty word in America. Um, not everywhere, not with everyone, and that's definitely changing from the state of affairs from Cold War era, Cold War years. But um, this is still uh, this is still a major obstacle. I um, this is a big part of the of section four, a big point that he's making. But the other thing that's just really really wise here. It, it, I guess I'm commenting now. I think it's very uh, apt and appropriate for Cohen to be sensitive to how we're going to actually think about the complexities of measuring social systems for which one gives more freedom and which one gives less freedom. This is very, very difficult to do. Um, Cohen in this section is really on the level that Warhain was at in Warhain's paper. If you remember her talk of like applying the capitalist model to these other circumstances and things don't always turn out the way that you think they will, um, that you have to understand not just the theoretical mechanisms of the model itself, but also the what Cohen calls the concrete, the practical uh, or the contingent circumstances of what's actually going on in the world. And I love his metaphor about the cars, like what car goes faster? You could just look at it on paper, which one's got more horsepower? You know, more aerodynamic, all this kind of stuff, weight ratios. You could you could look at that all on paper. But where is a car actually going to be driving? Somewhere in the real world. And depending on the driving conditions, one car versus another car might go faster. The Jeep is slower than the sports car. I mean, it's not as powerful as the sports car. But if we're talking about an off-road, then it's going to go faster than the sports car will. If we're talking about being on a highway, sports car is going to go faster. So Cohen is sensitive to this. He's like, under certain circumstances, communism won't give you more freedom. Under some circumstances, capitalism won't give you more freedom. There's always the room for those contingencies to kind of override things. And that's why he's sensitive to the contingency of what are people's attitudes about socialism or, or communism, um, that that will make a difference in whether or not that system actually gives them freedom or not. Um, if everyone in America was like, hell no communism, but for whatever reason, like all of our leaders, all of our political leaders, um, like Red Cohen, and we're like, oh man, we're convinced. We need to get out of the system of private property and turn this country into a socialist republic kind of thing. Um, man, a lot of people would have their freedoms violated, right? I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have access to the kinds of actions that they are invested in and they treat as valuable. They'd be, there'd be a lot of no saying. That would go on, right, for what people are able to do. Now, they might have other freedoms available, but if they don't care about them, then they kind of don't matter. And Cohen concedes that point. That's actually going to be something he's going to leverage in his main argument, which is happening in the next section, the kind of culminating argument of the whole paper. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and Cohen isn't a fatalist about these sorts of problems. He's just acknowledging their complexities, um, that this is a real obstacle. And I do think that in, in some ways, this is a another one of these concessions that Cohen is making where he's like, a lot of Marxists argue in, the, in a kind of not the best way for the same position that Cohen wants to defend. Um, that they're focused so much on the theoretical nature of this and are ignoring the, the contingencies, the particulars of, like, say, the society they're working with, right? Um, 
that they that might be a blind spot for their analysis and for their arguments and and they it there is a, a tendency in the in Mar for Marxists to be, I mean, the, the orthodox Marxists to be like, yeah, capitalism is going to protect itself at all costs, and the only way to defeat it is with a revolution. Like, people have to get really civilly disobedient <laughs> in order to make this actually happen. Um, so there's that kind of pessimism about it. And I think Cohen is much more optimistic about this. He's like, look, I can sell socialism to capitalists because and this is where the, the argument in the fifth section so I'm kind of transitioning into fifth section now um, the the sort of the thesis statement for this section is Cohen says he wants to argue that socialists and capitalist models are offering the same kind of freedom and that is really important to him it's, he's, he says I need to emphasize this point because that's going to be the basis on whether he's actually going to be able to convince any capitalists to become socialists or to buy into um, communally held property systems. They imagine it this way: you've got freedoms under capitalism, right? Cohen Cohen admits as much. He's like, "Yep, capitalism gives you freedom." Um, so then someone comes up to you and is like, "So now you got some freedoms right now, but there's a whole bunch of different freedoms that you could have if you gave up that system entirely. You've never seen these things before. You don't even know what they're like. You don't know what it's like to live them or anything like that. But just trust us. You know, give up what you know and let's do this thing you don't know." People aren't going to buy into that, right? If communism was offering a completely different type of freedom than capitalism would, this would be a major problem. But Cohen thinks, no, we're not comparing apples and oranges here. These are apples to apples, and that's why he that I went, you know, I made such a big deal at the beginning, and Cohen makes such a big deal about this definition of freedom, because that creates the common currency theoretically, um, the theoretical currency here that allows us to even make the comparison. That what we're interested in is access to certain actions as being available to us as options for choice. That's what it comes down to. And he thinks capitalism gives you this, but so does communism. And they're packaged up in a different way, but you're getting the same kind of thing. So it's sort of like saying, hey, if you like capitalist freedoms, you're going to love communist freedoms. Because it's really the same thing that you know, just better, more, more options. So how would that look? I'm going to fix the lighting here. Oh, no way. Cool. Awesome. So happy to hear it. <laughs> um, it's getting dark here. Uh, so hopefully we can get some light in your face, sort of. Yeah. Okay, we'll make do. We're almost done. Getting in the home stretch here. So... Um, actually, I'm going to pull up the lecture notes here again. I want to do this carefully. So, do, 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 do. Here, we're down here in section five. Um, okay, so kind of stepping back here, reframing it up. Cohen again emphasizes he doesn't think capitalism is some kind of slavery. And that the idea of justifying a communist revolution as basically the this oppressed slave class uh, needs to rise up against their oppressors. He, he's just he's just not taking that kind of angle with this, um, and he also doesn't think that um, it's fair to say that capitalism is opposed to true freedom or something like that. Because remember again, he's not buying into a Marxist definition of freedom. He's buying into the libertarian capitalist conception of freedom, this access of action. And he and he, it's not just because he's trying to throw a bone to his opponents here dialectically. He sincerely believes that this is the most philosophically respectful way to understand what freedom is as a phenomenon. But he says, um, if we're going to justify socialism, then it has to be justified on the grounds that it gives the same kinds of freedoms that capitalism has, but just more of them. Um, and there is going to be some... I mean, he's he's going to rephrase some, if you've studied any Marx before, you're familiar with Marxist thought, you might see some familiar Marxist talking points here, but definitely translated into the conceptual vocabulary Cohen is using here. So he takes some of the points that sometimes Marxists make as like, there's a different kind of freedom that you get under communism, um, and just says, this isn't a different kind of freedom, but there's there still is a point there that they're making. More on that in a couple minutes. Um but the other, the other way, not only, so he's going to try to say two things, basically. Communism gives you the same kinds of freedoms that capitalism gives you, just more of them. And capitalism doesn't give you all of the freedoms that it sort of promises on paper. Um, 
and that that has to do that case has been sort of made through the last couple sections where he's been emphasizing all the no saying that's involved in systems of private property okay so um, here it to me is like the core of Cohen's main argument in favor of communally held property and it's his example of the tools so um, I like this kind of setting for the for the illustration here um, imagine we all live on a cul-de-sac some like suburban America somewhere right and everyone on that cul-de-sac owns a frickin' lawnmower everyone has to have one because that's how private property works if you want a loan lawnmower you're gonna have to buy one if you want to if you want to cut your grass if you want that to be a choice you can make that you have access to you need to have access to a lawnmower how do you get access by owning one that's how it works but in some ways this is like super inefficient and, not, and I'm not talking about market inefficiencies here although there's a case to be made for that too um, but we're talking here about like freedom efficiencies what setup how could we design the rules of society that's going to give people more of this kind of freedom thing that they care to have right to have access to more of the things that they want to be able to choose in life um, if we bought one lawnmower and then had communal ownership of it then we don't all need to buy a lawnmower and that stands to reason because I'm not planning on mowing my lawn every day of the week if I do plan to have that kind of access and the communist system doesn't allow me to do that then maybe I need to go buy a lawnmower and again like I said Cohen's not all or nothing about all this stuff right um, so there might be room for this kind of hybrid thing but he's what he's really trying to push um, on our plate is just recognizing the opportunities there are for expanded freedoms through cooperative behavior through communally held property okay, that's that's the goal here so if I mean buying a lawnmower myself is kind of expensive um, if we all chip in on a lawnmower and then divide up what days of the month different people get access to it then we can use that money for something else all right we'll be able to we'll have the means to be able to choose other actions that we want to be able to gain access to and to participate with. Um, and we can imagine that happening on a lot more things than just the lawnmower. Um, so that's that's a that's kind of a a toy case to illustrate Cohen's general point. Um, it, he, he uses an example with the tools like I buy some tools, you buy other tools, and then we've got a system where there's the tools are like mutual access, right? And it could be as simple as like, if I'm using the tool, then you have to wait, and I'll, when I'm done with it, I'll put it back, and then you get to have access to it. Now, some people don't want that. We're going to talk about that in a second. They want to have complete dominion over the object. They want to be able to have all of the control, and thus all the freedom, with respect to that thing, uh, or that opportunity, instead of like having some of it, okay? And instead of short of total. Communal property is still property. It still gives me access to the thing. Um, some other examples. Uh, here's just a silly anecdote from my childhood. Um, my brother and I, uh, we didn't we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Um, I'd say I'd say we were about we were above the poverty line, but we were kind of like lower middle class, like upper lower class, something in there. Um, uh, the, those words don't much mean anything anymore. But uh, we saved up our allowances for a very very long time. And then we chipped, our, we put our money together, we pooled our money to buy a Game Boy from uh, a local pawn shop. And, uh, you know, we both want to use the Game Boy. We, either one of us individually would not have been able to, we wouldn't have had the freedom to purchase it. We didn't have the means to do so. Um, but together we could have, and we did. And then we had to, ha we had to create a system. We had to uh, create a system to organize who was going to have access to it when. And we were able to do that. It wasn't so hard to do it. Sometimes it was like, hey, your time's up. It's, it's my turn now. And the person's like, no, I'm not done yet. You know, we're children, right? Um, but we were able to work that out. And um, there's sometimes the objection that um, communist systems are uh, more bureaucratic and thus less efficient they, because they have to be managed. Um, Cohen makes a little interesting point. I don't know if anyone caught it in the reading, but he kind of addresses that very, very quickly. He expands on this more elsewhere, but um, he makes a point really quickly that capitalist systems have a lot of upkeep too. And the reason is that these things are usually all separated, 
right? That the, the links of the chain of the economy between me and the thing that I want can be very much separated. Or think about um, the, all the way that money is managed, um, like through stockbrokers and hedge funds and things like this. All those transactions have a cost. To be able to arrange a scenario in which people are able to conduct this transaction um, so that they're able to get access to the thing that they want uh, is itself bureaucratic. We don't usually put that word to it, but if you're thinking about this from the standpoint of the complexity of the social institutional system that enables these freedoms to happen, there are plenty of organizational costs that happen with systems of private property too. So we could compare those kinds of costs, but that's not a matter of freedom so much. Cohen's bottom line point is that um, if I trade total dominion of objects, a system of private property, for a system that incorporates some uses of communally held property, a enough of portions of property ownership can overwhelm the kind of total freedom that I get from privately owning things. Now, of course, in a vacuum, uh, if we're talking about access to an object, if I owned everything, then that would be better than sharing in it with everybody. But who gets to have access to that? Only a few people, right? Only the economically elite. And if we're talking about a social system overall that's promoting... Whoa, 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 whoa. Oops. Oh, that's a little mouse. Um, sorry about that. My mouse clicked something it wasn't supposed to click. Um, I lost my train of thought. Dang it. Shoot. <laughs> that just freaked me out. Sorry. I was talking about um, how enough... Uh, okay, of course it would be better if I owned everything. Oh, right, right, right. So you have to be economically elite in order to be able to have that be an option for you, for that to be a freedom. A choice between those two things is only available for the super rich. Um, and if we're talking about a social system which on the whole is promoting freedom for people in society, that ain't it, right? Um, it's, it's very similar to the reflections, I think, that are in Rawls's original position. No one wants to take the gamble that they're going to turn out to be the 1%, right? With the risk of being someplace else with a lot less freedoms. And I think part of the American dream, which we'll talk about a little bit next week, um, is this, like, I'm cool with a system that works this way as long as I sort of have this confidence or belief that I will be able to become one of those people. And I'm attracted to that possibility um, that I might be in this position where I don't have to deal with other people, et cetera, et cetera. But Cohen's saying, like, as a matter of uh, just looking at these situations, not anticipating, like, okay, I'm going to deal with all this unfreedom now because maybe I'll be able to assert myself into this position in society where I'm going to have all these more freedoms that I wouldn't have if we just had this kind of com commune equality thing happening. Um, that there's still a lot of advantages here for freedom expanding options that come from communally held property. And that's the really core of his argument. Now, he goes into some more details about this though. Let us go further here. Let me go back to my lecture notes here. So he says, so along this point, like I was saying, if you have property ownership, private property ownership, you have complete dominion over that object. And wouldn't that be full freedom with respect to that thing? So if like I own the lawnmower sitting in my garage, anytime I want, I'd be able to take it out there, right? And he says, well, there's a couple things that compromise that line of reasoning. First one is that point I was emphasizing earlier that I said would come back. It may not matter. There's a lot of freedoms that I just don't care to have, that I don't care if that's an option. Like how much does it make me feel better that I know like every time I come home when I'm busy and tired or something I'm like if I wanted to mow my lawn right now I could because I own that thing I could do it whenever I want right it's kind of like um I I'm a I've told you before a board game hobbyist love board games um, and I um, somewhat to my shame have quite a lot of them at this point I have quite a collection and the reason why I say shame is that I've got more games than I can play I played them all. I mean, it's kind of like a library. Like I like sometimes feel like I'm curating a museum kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I only buy games when I think there's something really special. Um, like I'm an enthusiast about just the hobby itself. I'm fascinated by game design and, and things of that nature. Um, 
but I don't need all these games. And so what I do, um, like if I just was sitting at my home being like, I could play all these games. I have all this freedom. That just, what kind of value is that? Right. And so I loan them out to people. I share them with people. I let my family and friends borrow them all the time. Cause I'm like, I want these to be used. I want, um, people to have access and thus freedom to engage with these games. And if they're just sitting on my shelf, then it, they don't do that, right? And I can have access to it, but other people um, can't, right? If I've got it. They can buy their own copy, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, so Cohen's thinking that it matters what freedoms we care to have um, when we're thinking about which system gives us more freedom. If one system gives us a bunch of freedoms, but like most of those freedoms we don't care about. And this other one gives us even maybe less freedoms, but more of the freedoms that we actually care to exercise. That's the one that's going to win in this debate, right? In this fight about like which one's providing more freedom. Um, if I really only care to mow my lawn two weeks out of the month, or even maybe one week out of the month, then a kind of arrangement where we're able to share the property ownership of the of the uh, lawnmower is not really a big deal to me i'm like pretty happy and content about that and as a lot of my students were remarking this afternoon like i alluded to at the beginning of the lecture um there's a lot of ways in which these sorts of systems happen already um i had a student who was talking about uh just families families are communist systems um if you if like the we're using the example of um there aren't there it's not like everyone's bedroom has a bathroom right? You share the bathroom. It's a communal property. And you have to work out systems for how that happens. Like who gets to take showers when, you know, this kind of thing, cleaning it, you know, the upkeep on it, all that kind of stuff. Um, oh, I got some text here in the chat. Um, thinking out loud, Walter says, identify the, the, we need to keep dreaming in the notes because these political systems can all be argued for in a post-scarcity economy, but they do maintain their relevancy in a time where the basic survival needs are not easily attainable. I think given the environmental concerns, future generations may have to consider more sustainable systems in terms of natural resources to be able to experience today's social freedoms. Amen. <laughs> in, in a lot of different ways here. The post-scarcity thing is huge. Also the environmental thing. Like I, I don't know how many of you have actually read the Green New Deal or know what that thing is actually proposing, but it's basically saying something like um, what we have to do to basically save our future is going to screw with a lot of people. It's going to take away a lot of freedoms and a lot of access. And if we just plowed ahead on that, the people on the bottom of society are going to suffer a lot. That's the first half of the Green New Deal. The second half is like, here's what we're going to do about it. And we're going to have to f provide alternate means for people to be able to have livelihood and to enjoy the freedoms that we've got. Um, <clears throat> that's really what the game plan of the Green New Deal is. But also the post-scarcity thing fits in really well with Cohen's argument about public health care uh, in that section when we were talking about that earlier. In the sense that um, uh, I really care, remember the thing about like why do we care about economic freedoms, the freedoms to be able to engage buying and selling on the market? It's mostly because this is how I'm able to get access to the things I need for my livelihood. Like, if I was not allowed to participate in capitalism, I'd be screwed. How am I supposed to eat? <laughs> right? I have to go to the supermarket, go buy food. That's a that's a transaction that happens on a market. If I'm excluded from that, that really sucks. Right? Um, same thing with having a job, which we talked about before. If I need a job in order to have livelihood, then I really care to have that freedom. The freedom to apply for jobs, uh, to be considered fairly for them, all this kind of stuff. If I'm being blackballed from employment, that's my life at stake, my family's life, right? That's a real big problem. But in a post-scarcity world um, where there's universal basic income or other things like that going on and people don't need to work for their livelihood, now the moral significance of employment takes on something different. Arguably, I might say it's better. I mean, when people talk about the dignity of employment, of, of like labor and investing in the in society and contributing to it, that's something that should be done for its own sake. I mean, that's where the real moral dignity of it comes in, of like self-improvement and all those kinds of benefits. But the way it is right now, like Mark says, people who are not owners of the means of production, who are not in the wealthy elite, are forced to sell their labor, be employed, 
in order to um, have livelihood. And in a different situation, that would take on a drastically different meaning. Um, so yes, in terms of thinking about the rules in which how we're going to set up society, how's the economy going to function? Is it going to work on private property, communal property, universal basic income, not like what is going to happen here? does really depend on some of the other circumstances and how we treat certain policy moves or certain particular freedoms to draw into the arguments I was just talking about in section five of the lecture, which of those freedoms we care to have can change. It's contingent based on those kinds of circumstances. But Cohen is saying whatever system we're going to agree to needs to give us more of the freedoms that actually matter. The ones that we are invested in actually exerting okay and he thinks there are not always and not across the board but there are many many cases in which uh, communal property gives you some more options there for expanding your freedoms than a private property system would I did say that there are some exceptions here and again it fits really much on this theme of like what freedoms matter so take for example this is my favorite cartoon example for this um, say we work in an office building in a communist society and uh, I've got a little picture of my grandmother that I have sitting on my desk I like to look at it while I'm working if someone came up and is like hey we live in a communist society that means no private property so your time with the grandmother photo is up it's my turn to have like my hour with it on my desk I'd be like what this is totally absurd right even if other things need to be shared um, in this little community that we've got at the office building um, that's not one of them it's okay to give that as like private property to me and me alone only I have freedoms of access to this uh, grandmother photo right and one of the big reasons why it's not really asking much to infringe on other people's freedoms to give me that total domination of the object is that no one else really cares to have freedom with that thing right it matters to me because of my relationship with my grandmother you don't have that relationship with my grandmother, right? So um, that's uh, that that's an illustration of how Cohen's not going to go 100% here. And if we're going to give an inch to communism, then we're giving it all away or something like that. Um, that's that's not the proposal that's on the table. Um, are those uh, case examples making sense? How are we doing, chat? We're almost done here. I'm not hearing anything. Okay, I hope it's going well. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's let's finish this stuff off. I'm gonna try to make this happen in in 15 minutes. Um, cool. Thanks, Walter. There's one other argument that Cohen brings up in this section. Um, another kind of problem for this idea that uh, private property is what gives me full freedom with respect to a thing. Something he thinks takes some of the teeth out of that kind of appeal on the grounds of freedom. And he says, uh, I'm just going to go up to my lecture notes here. He's a, I, I put it this way, it smells of bourgeois materialism. And this is the one instance in the whole paper where Cohen uh, is sort of like, I got I to gotta say something about these uh, concerns about like cultural bias, a, per, a pernicious bias that capitalism gives off. Um, under capitalism, this is a classic Marxist critique. Um, that we fetishize control over material things and think about our freedom in terms of them. Think back to our definition of freedom. Freedom here for this, for purposes of this conversation is access to actions that are available to me. Right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. There are a whole lot of freedoms that have nothing to do with ownership of material things. It doesn't have to do with property itself. But under capitalism, property becomes super important. Um, it's the means by which all other freedoms are attainable, right? It's, it's cash, liquid cash, that unlocks all those gates, that lets you engage with life. And we can start getting too attached to the bag of cash instead of the things that we want to actually have access to. And Cohen's concerned about that. So um, the, the idea that... Um, I need to have total domination of a thing or it's worthless to me is a kind of attachment 
that he he just wants to call out as as bullshit. And um, and I'm, I'm going to bring up another anecdote here from my class this afternoon. One of the students who was presenting on on Cohen today did their presentation today. They called me up yesterday. They, they followed my encouragement to talk to me before giving a presentation. And um, they did have a bunch of misconceptions. I was mentioning this at the beginning. And um, they were uh, – they're just like, I don't know. This, this just isn't me. And we talked about it and we clarified some things about what Cohen stands for and how he's arguing for it. And then by the end of the conversation and then the presentation today kind of was like, whoa, that was a very different story I heard from your presentation than the phone call yesterday. Um, he, it sounded like he did some reflection on this and he's like, yeah, I just, I just want to have things. Like it's comforting. It makes me feel secure, uh, at peace to know that thing is mine. No one else gets to touch it. I don't have to deal with anyone. I just, I just have it. It's mine. It's my precious. No, I'm just, I'm <laughs> A little Lord of the Rings reference there. But this kind of like irrational attachment to things as being so meaningful rather than the living that we do and that what freedom is really all about. Uh, the freedom to be a hoarder is not what we really – Cohen thinks what we should really have in mind is the ideal here. Um, that's not what life is really all about. So there's a little there's a little bit of that going on. This, again, is on the theme of freedoms that matter, like what are the freedoms we care to have. Um, not all freedoms are equal here when we're weighing up which thing gives us the most freedom. Okay. One final thing, one final set of thoughts here. Cohen entertains a possible response that the capitalists can make at this point, to specifically to this charge of how uh, under communism you get access to all these other things you couldn't have access to before. And that response leans on the idea of the market, the ability to participate in the market. So for example, I've got all these board games, maybe I get sick and tired of some of them. I got them, I got the freedom to play them if I want to, but I don't really want to anymore. So what can I do? Well. Uh, there's a lot of board game conventions that happen across the nation. I could, and they always have these swap meets. So I could bring a bunch of the games that I'm like, I'm done playing them. I wanted to play it. It was a great game. I had fun playing it. Kind of done playing it now. I can take it to the convention, find other people who are in a similar situation. We exchange games. We tr we barter, right? And exchange them. And now I got access. So uh, we can get those kinds of market efficiencies. We can get the resources in the hands of the people. That most want to have them right we can make available those opportunities to the people who most want to uh, participate in them right um, and so this does give you an idea of extended freedom and Cohen's got two responses the first one he says is kind of weakish is a callback to this concern about fetishizing materialism like material ownership or dominion of objects so he says I'm just gonna read the quote to you here life under capitalism tends as a matter of like a cultural dynamic, tends to generate an irrationally strong attachment to purely private use of purely private property, which can lead to neglect of mutually gainful and freedom expanding options. And what he means by that are just that I become closed off to the possibility of how being in community with other people, sharing property in a communal way, might actually give me some more freedom. So I, I it's missed opportunities. Um, and, he, and he, I think he thinks of this as weak because it's dependent upon this kind of prediction of a, a, a cultural impact that capitalism has that's not intrinsic to capitalism. Right? You can imagine, I, I mean, I can imagine as a logical possibility uh, a capitalist society of Buddhists. I mean, it's not impossible. It's, it's, not, it's not impossible. It's real weird. <laughs> I mean, it, it's abnormal. Um, it might stretch your imagination to conceive of it, but it's it's possible. So people are completely detached to desires, but participate in a capitalist way of distributing resources, an economic system, right? It could, it could be done that way. Um, uh, with the provision that like strict Orthodox Buddhists, uh, one of the renunciations of if you're a monk or a nun is you renounce possessing property. So, I mean... But you can imagine, like I said, they're so detached, it's okay if they own it. And actually, most Buddhist communities do own property at this point uh, in the 21st century. So, you know, but anyway. But that could be conceivable. But Cohen, I think, still has a point here that there there is a cultural dynamic here. But that's the reason why he calls it weak is just that 
this isn't getting at something that is intrinsic or necessary about the capitalist system, but a kind of like bad side effect of it that does have a side, a side effect impact on freedom and basically missed opportunities for freedoms. But the more developed response is this one. This Cohen basically says this kind of way of using the market to extend access uh, only works for the people who get to play in the market, which is kind of a point that was brought up earlier. Um, but this is kind of getting more into like Rawlsian territory. Um, the thing, the the way in which the market makes the most sense morally in terms of freedoms, are when you've got a bunch of people who are from basically equal negotiating positions, bargaining positions. Um, like in the case of the board game swap meet, like no one's ever able to like leverage something over someone else in the swap. It, I mean, it's like I don't care about these games. You know it. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Like my interest in retaining property on this is really low, and I know yours is really low too. So we're in the same boat. Like we can work out a win-win scenario very easily there, and that that's a kind of capitalist transaction, right? It's an exchange of goods and services. But when the parties are unequal with respect to their power, when me spending twenty bucks is not the same as you spending twenty bucks that the risk or the exposure or the practical weighing that I'm doing of my options is a different choice matrix for me than it is for you, then getting into those kind of negotiating results that are true win-wins of mutual benefit just don't happen. And Cohen is saying this especially happens when it comes to control of the means of production, which is the classic Marxist point here, that basically this is not a free market as long as some people own the means of production right that's a big problem they basically have everyone else in society over a barrel the people who are controlling the systems themselves in capitalism where that's private property um, are in the way increased leveraged negotiating position here and uh, everyone else is kind of screwed and that's why they're forced to um, uh, sell their labor. So it gets back to the theme right at the beginning of the whole paper of how it's possible to have freedom and coercion happening simultaneously, which is a central Marxist thesis. Um, oh, Walter, you said I cut out a bit. Uh, how much did you lose? Like a minute. Oh, no. Okay. Um, where was the point that you lost me? What was the last thing you remember me saying before it cut out? I think it was about the, um, the people that get to play in the market. Okay. Kind of the start of that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to summarize it quickly so I'm not repeating myself for the YouTube people. But um, the basic idea here is that um, have, like the capitalist dream is exchanges that are win-wins. Right, that the free market allows people to get efficient distributions of resources. Um, that the people who most need them get them. The people um, who don't care about them sell them, right? Um, rather than people hoarding stuff, hoarding resources. So that liquidity of the markets is, is good. It makes people happier. It gives people more access to the freedoms they care about. But Cohen is saying that only works under situations where you assume kind of mutual power or equal power in the bargaining. And without that, you're not going to get results like that, especially in the classic Marxist case that they're always concerned about with capitalism when the means of production are held as private property. Because basically the people who are in that elite in society who own the means of production have everyone else over a barrel. And so you're not going to get win-win situations. You'll get win-sort-of-win-lose situations. That's what you'll get. Is it still bad? Did it cut out again? It's fine. Okay, cool. Phew. So that's Cohen. Um, I managed to get it all done under two hours. I can't believe it. Um, but it happened. And I don't feel like I skipped anything or, or did anything um, too rushed or something like that. 
but I'm curious what you all are thinking about it. Um, like I said, I'm really used to this unit being one fraught with misunderstanding and just confusion, and it's, it's just difficult. And uh, so I definitely would like to help with that as much as I possibly can. And while you're thinking about anything you want to say here in the chat, or feel free to use your microphones if you want to, too, here. Um, oh, gosh. What am I going to do for a code word? Let me think. I'll think about a code word while you're thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, yeah. There's a lot of varieties within those categories. Um, I've been kind of using these things interchangeably for the purposes of this conversation because it's really, it really comes down to how we conceive of property rights. Are they total and absolute? That's private property. Total dom domination over something. Um, if something's going to happen, it has to come through you kind of thing. Or alternatively, uh, where property is shared by more than one party. <clears throat> whether we're, we're operating in that kind of way about property. Um, so there's a lot of different theoretical distinctions on offer there between what socialism stands for and what communism stands for. There's also so many varieties of it that I, I, don't, have a, I don't have a definition to offer that I think is going to be the sort of universal thing here that you could take into any context of these sorts of conversations. You kind of always need to ask people what they're talking about. And for the purposes of Cohen, the thing he's interested in is communally held property. That that's what he's that's what he's trying to argue for. Just that, and he's like really again open about maybe in some cases it's the right way to go with it, in other cases it's not the right way to go with it. I yeah, Cohen is not. Um, directly attacking Rawls here. Um, in fact, I'm really interested... I mean, Rawls, in his setup for like the original position, Veil of Ignorance, he does think we're going to buy into capitalism. So he commits to that. But whether that's the proper expectation for what the Maxi Min principle and the Liberty principle are going to tell us to do is another story. And I think Cohen has a case here to make that actually... If we're really following those two principles that you're talking about, Rawls, we'll agree to a system of society that's got broadly socialist elements in a pretty robust way. I mean, Rawls does say he thinks we're not going to prefer a welfare state, um, but that's mostly because he's got concerns about freedom, and he, he thinks freedom is going to take higher priority over well-being, right? He says that, uh, Rawls says that in his theory, mm -hmm. and it might be that he has a lesson to learn from Cohen about maybe don't concede the game to capitalism so fast that it's the best way to protect people's freedoms. And so if Rawls commits to freedom being the most important thing, and under that moral value, communism wins out a lot of the time, then Rawls is basically going to have to give up on his prediction that people in the original position would favor a capitalist system. But that's why I say it's like interesting to think about the Cohen-Rawls crossover fan fiction or something. <laughs> um, how would those two theories interact or have a discussion with each other? Yeah. Um, code word. I need to think of a code word. I can't forget. Um, I'm turning into a pumpkin. It's so silly. I can like think uh, about all these different complex intellectual theoretical issues, and I can't pick an arbitrary code word. Um, how about a uh, code word tonight is just thank you. Um, this is our last video lecture, and I've seen very regular faces here at the live, uh, the live sessions, and I really appreciate you showing up. As I said way back at the beginning, um, just even if you're not dropping tons of comments into the thing, just knowing that someone is there and listening makes my experience of lecturing on this video way different. That I know that there's a person on the other end. It's like I'm not just talking to myself into a phone or something. Um, so uh, the code word tonight is thank you. That's the code word.
a little cheesy, but I'll do it. Anything else you want to talk about in chat? I'm really surprised if there's like no reactions or questions at all. I mean, I, I yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, Thank Leticia. You so You're welcome. Okay, well, I'll stop the recording for people on YouTube, and, and uh, if anyone wants to hang around and talk a little bit more, I, I'll be here.